Hello everyone, I'm Matthew Taylor, the RSA's Chief Executive. It's my great pleasure to welcome you for this evening's special event. Can you make sure your mobile phone is silent, but um, feel free to keep it on and to join the online conversation. The hashtag is RSA FETL, F-E-T-L. Um, and also we are live streaming, so welcome to all uh, the, uh, our viewers online. Um, now, as the hashtag suggests, this evening's event marks the culmination of a partnership between the RSA and FETL, the Further Education Trust for Leadership, which has resulted in this rather beautiful publication, Possibility Thinking, a new set of essays launched today which explores a number of possibilities for innovation and leadership across the FE and skills sector. We've brought together a brilliant expert panel to offer their responses to the essays and to share their own reflections on what is needed to inspire a new sense of energy and optimism for a sector which has often felt rather deflated, depressed and put upon in recent times. Uh, they will join us up here after our keynote address, which I'm delighted to say will be delivered by Sir Vince Cable. As you will know well, Vince Cable was the Liberal Democrat Member of Parliament for Twickenham from 1997 to 2015 and Secretary of State for Business, Innovation and Skills in the Coalition Government from 2010 to 2015. Since leaving office, Vince has returned to writing, publishing After the Storm in 2015, which focused on Britain's future in the world economy. And along with campaigning on current issues, Vince remains at the very centre of political and economic discourse. So it's a great honour to have Vince back here at the RSA, and please join me uh, in welcoming him. Well, th thank you for inviting me back after the very good event you had here when I was with David Blunkett and David Willits and others on a, on a similar theme, and it's a relief not to have to talk about Europe or <laughs> party reorganisation and things of that kind and talk about something really important. Um, and I just wanted to congratulate the RSA on having produced this uh, ex excellent collection of thinking. Um, quite apart from the thoughts in it, I, there were some absolutely wonderful sound bites that, that we can all use. I, 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 there was the, the two that caught my eye. There was uh, that we should think about FE colleges not as organisations, but organs of possibility was one. And another one that I thought was quite beautiful was the idea of loyalty to the future. I hadn't heard that one before. But I think the, the underlying theme... Uh, was optimism. You know, we've been in a, a sector that has been rather battered, um, you know, including the, by the financial position that the government I was in inflicted. Um, but nonetheless, it is an optimistic, forward-looking view about how skill training, further education, continuing in education can come together. And I think that's a really valuable contribution. I think it would be, however, a bit strange if I didn't make any reference to what's going on outside. I mean, it, it, it's, it's happening. Uh, and the, the whole issue around Brexit, which we're now committed to, is going to impact on every sector of society and the economy. And I, I thought initially perhaps just set out a few of the ways in which it could influence the discussions that we're having here. Um, I mean, in, in a way, the, the FE sector isn't as directly affected as universities. Universities potentially face a very big double whammy that they will lose a lot of research funding and they will also lose access to uh, university students, many of whom currently benefit from um, European students who can access uh, maintenance on the same basis as British students and they will go. I mean, uh, there will be a big drop in students who they're currently recruiting. So the FE sector doesn't have those two big whammies, but nonetheless there are implications and I'd, I was thinking about some of them and maybe in the audience you'll have your own separate views on it. But I think first of all the whole debate around immigration, which has been at the centre of the Brexit debate and which will now dominate the Brexit outcomes, in other words, there will be restrictions of some kind on freedom of movement, um, has massive implications for skill training. Because if you, you know, if you exclude people, which is going to be the object of policy, uh, the skills have got to be provided at home. And in many ways, the immigration... Um, 
the net immigration figure is a reflection of the neglect of past skill training. So th there is a challenge and an opportunity which comes out of that, and I think that's very, very important. I think, secondly, uh, there will almost certainly be an economic slowdown. I mean, we can, I'm not here to uh, re-preach Armageddon, but you know, there, there will almost certainly be an economic slowdown and potentially worse. Uh, and I fear one of the inevitable consequences of all of that is that the public finance position will be even weaker in years to come than it is today. And that is going to impact on public spending and public spending priorities and the idea that we, we could see the light at the end of the tunnel in terms of public spending squeezes. I think that hope has been deferred for a long time. So that's, that's a difficulty. Uh, I think... To my mind, the most significant and worrying feature of what's now going to happen is that there will be a massive, massive diversion of energy, displacement activity, in which MPs for the next five years or more and the whole of the civil service is now switched onto a problem which was unnecessary, but you know, it's happened. Uh, it has massive implications. I was just reflecting a little bit on some of the things I had to do in the closing phases of the last government. If you take the issue around devolution, Scottish devolution, which is a, a minor, minor problem compared with um, Brexit from the European Union, the amount of ministerial and civil service time that would be taken up negotiating an issue like how do you divide consumer protection between England and Scotland? And just imagine that that is multiplied a thousand times or the kind of thing that I would get involved with, which was some of the detail around the European Union's trade agreement with India, uh, around financial services access, or um, the so-called uh, mode four, freedom of access for IT specialists. Now that, you know, that's something the system handled, and I would spend a day here and a day there on it, but think of that multiplied hundreds, if not thousands of times. And all the intellect, the creative energy of our actually quite high quality system is going to be diverted into solving those problems. Now, I mean, in a way, that you could say that's an opportunity because if I can uh, coin a phrase, if you can take control of your uh, bit of the system uh, and exploit it and just be on innovative and entrepreneurial, nobody's going to notice. But it does mean, I'm afraid, that if you're dependent on policy decisions in Whitehall, it's going to be very, very difficult to make a great deal of, of headway. Uh, and finally, I mean, of course, all of this has got political knock-on effects. We, we know that um, there's going to be a change in prime minister, a new ministerial team. I know from my period that uh, it was one of the big lessons I learned in government that time is a great maturer and, and help. I had five years in my job and at the end of it I felt I knew if as much if not more than my civil servants but constantly changing people is massively disruptive. Ministers will come in who don't understand anything about the sector and its needs and how you implement complicated issues like an apprenticeship levy. It'll all have to be relearned again. So those are some of the implications some opportunities and some problems, but I hope that helpful, it is a helpful bit of analysis. However, despite that, I mean, there are some things that will continue, some inevitable trends, uh, which, some of which are helpful, some of which are not. The first of which is demographic. I, I hadn't realized until I read through some of the papers uh, as a background to this uh, event, that within the next 10 years, um, about 7 million uh, people from the British population will enter the labour force. But 12 million will leave. There's a sort of gap of 5 million people, somehow, on the assumption that other economic trends continue. Now, in the past, we've rather lazily assumed that a lot of those gaps will be filled, filled from people overseas. Well, it's difficult to see that happening now. Uh, and of course, a lot. So, what, what I think we need to start planning for is that a lot of those 12 million people who are planning to retire will no longer retire. In any event, the change in pension policy makes it unattractive. 
So one enormous challenge which is looming up and which is of particular relevance to the FE sector is how do you train, retrain, remotivate um, uh, older people, 50 plus people, who will want to stay in the labor force full time or part time. That is now becoming a massive imperative as a result of demographic change. I think the other big trend which is taking place daily, we can do absolutely nothing about, uh, but is massively important, is what's happening technologically. Uh, and this presents both challenges and opportunities, the challenge being that large numbers of people, um, their livelihoods are going to disappear. Uh, and often not just, you know, routine manual things, but, you know, solicitors finding that the regular work is, can now be done on an automated basis. Um, all the kind of thing, I mean, I'm, one of my other uh, roles at the moment is preparing a MOOC, um, Massive Online Teaching Course in Economics, which I'm doing with the University of Nottingham. And, and I, it's a good thing, but I suspect it will, if it's successful, displace the jobs of a substantial number of university lecturers who will no longer be required to stand in front of classes as they once used to. So technology is changing, displacing, creating a need for the renovation of skills and aptitudes. But of course it also presents an opportunity to the sector and I thought there were some very good papers in the collection of essays. Um, I think Michael, Michael Barber was one, suggesting how a combination of uh, digitization and uh, automatic intelligence, uh, AI, can be used to transform learning methods and raising the question why can't the FE sector lead the way in a lot of this. So challenge but also opportunities. And I'm inclined to add a third to the list of trends, though it probably should put a question mark against it, it's not as inevitable as the other two which is the trend towards decentralization within the UK. We began a process um, a few years ago of gradually repatriating to uh, local government, now combined authorities, uh, important functions. I think this is now past the point of no return. Uh, you're getting um, significant national politicians who are refugees from Westminster. Uh, beginning to look for opportunities as elected mayors, uh, and that's certainly that's good. Um, and so the people running Birmingham and Manchester and Liverpool and Newcastle or future authorities will be people with real stature, and they in turn, as we've discovered through Scottish devolution, will want more authority and more controls locally. Um, we've already seen skill training and a lot of decisions over FE. Uh, devolve to, in a rather chaotic way, and not varies from place to place and uh, different areas with different ideas about what they're going to do about it. But decentralization does give local autonomy, gives people freedom and space to experiment, and uh, uh, indeed opportunities. So that's, that's the sort of wide context. Uh, what I thought it would be quite useful to do um, in, in the rest of my comments is to summarize um, some of the opportunities uh, that have arisen and which are summarized in these essays uh, and which help to fuel the optimism uh, which lies behind the, the, this uh, report. I think the first is that there is a significant opportunity for uh, FE colleges in particular within that sector uh, within the framework that I sketched out shortly before I left office in the green paper, which we call the dual mandate, that there is a major need for the sector to do two things, two quite different things, which have often got muddled and conflated. But one of them is higher skills, um, skill level three and above, uh, which have been kind of sorely neglected, uh, been damaged over half a century by the obsession with um, turning cats into universities and other experiments and the devaluation of uh, vocational skill training. Uh, and there will be a massive need for higher level skills to be developed and a big opportunity for colleges within that to build on their expertise. Um, so that's one of the two elements in the dual mandate and the other is very much at the other extreme, 
which is in a way going back to the old night school um, concept. Uh, people who need a second chance, want a second chance, fallen behind, probably left, left school very early, now in their 50s, uh, haven't got adequate skills of literacy, numeracy, computer literacy, or indeed uh, wider um, ability to, to think and organize the, the, their lives. And that is, is the second role which FE can perform, and perform it uniquely well, because universities won't do it. Uh, and other institutions have fallen by the wayside. So what I envisaged um, in the green paper was FE beginning to think about how each college can do either or both of those two things, as opposed to the medley of activities which have been uh, thrust upon it by governments, including a large amount of 16 to 19 year old uh, education, which is going to disappear probably because of 16 to 19 compulsory education and the growth of six forms. So that was one source of opportunity and optimism. I think the second is this awful word digitization. I've partly referred to that already. But I think getting ahead of the game uh, in terms of teaching methods, uh, using um, computers, distant learning in more imaginative ways. This is beginning to happen in the university sector, and I've seen it in some colleges. It will transform the way people learn over the next few years, and it's terribly important, it seems to me, that the sector gets ahead of it. And there were some constructive suggestions in those papers about how in practical terms it could be done. Um, my old department, it was suggested, should start offering prizes for people with really good innovative approaches in colleges, um, showing best practice, uh, and the idea of establishing what um, uh, Michael called ed, ed labs, um, places where you can go to which uh, try out new technologies. We, we developed this concept a little bit uh, with the Fab Lab movement, which some of you are familiar with in relation to invention but having that applied to uh, digital uh, training techniques and education. Uh, the third thought, um, which, and which is a very good essay in this set of papers, is what's called cities of learning. And this links back to my earlier comments about uh, decentralization and devolution. There is this movement in the United States uh, to um, educate people who have fallen through the system in a but, but using city government as a mechanism for doing that. And I think if we begin to think about the possibilities of some devolved governments and combined authorities, uh, one could see pilot studies leading to a kind of rollout of this kind of uh, activity. There is a, there's a wonderful word, actually, that was in that paper, which was called the precariat. I hadn't heard of this before. I think, I think it's trying to say this is the the proletariat, people who are now in precarious jobs. I think that's where the, the word come from. But it's, it, it, the, so the, 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 cities, um, the cities of learning concept is very much targeted at those people. These are people who are surviving, you know, they're earning a living, but in rather precarious uh, employment, um, zero hours contracts or some, something like that, who are not getting the opportunity to up their skills but providing a base by which they can acquire much more solidly based qualifications and equip them better to handle precariousness. So cities of learning was the first. I think a fourth is specialization. One of the things which is going to come out of the area reviews, and those I'm, I happen to sit on the governing board of my local adult college and everybody's waiting in great trepidation for these area reviews, and it's seen in a very threatening, rather gloomy way, but actually it doesn't need to be. Um, it is possible that um, it will be dealt with more creatively, uh, and colleges will be helped, guided, in some cases probably bullied, uh, into specialising in a much more um, effective way. I mean, 16 to 19 education is probably going, in many cases, certainly in my college, they decided to drop it. Um, my college has, has taken on the whole issue of adult learning for people with learning disability as a major area of specialization and competence, and it's doing it brilliantly. Um, there are some colleges are specializing in 
HE and FE, part-time, usually higher education, and doing it in a way that is in areas like, I mean, to take an example, Wiltshire, Swindon, there's no university. So it devolves very much to local colleges to uh, specialize in higher education and delivering it in a way that is appropriate to that community. I think a fifth area is admissions. Um, one of the things I tried to do in government, but we didn't get very far with it, was to try to integrate um, the university UCAS scheme with um, people proceeding into other forms of post-school learning, notably apprenticeships and FE admissions. And we didn't get very far because this is a university-led activity. But if we're going to get genuine parity of esteem, and if colleges are going to be, play their full role, particularly for younger people, uh, it seems to me perfectly sensible that we create a system where all of the options are available in terms of different kinds of learning in universities and outside, and we look at them in a comparable basis. At the moment, it's, if you're not going to university, it's absolutely chaotic. There isn't a easily accessible system, despite the efforts of the National Apprenticeship Service, to find out where apprenticeships are. Very difficult to compare and contrast FE learning in different places. So uh, some kind of streamlining of admissions using the UCAS model and possibly working with it uh, would be a, a helpful step. And I think my final point, um, and, and it's one of the suggestions made in these papers, which is uh, pr helping colleges to prepare for um, what it calls entrepreneurial leadership. Uh, I have to say my impression was, and I visited a lot of colleges and universities when I was Secretary of State, was that in general the FE sector was much more entrepreneurial than universities. The universities tended to be much more complacent, um, slightly snobbish in some cases, um, whereas universities, uh, FE colleges, if, if only because of dire necessity, we're thinking out of the box and trying new things and very often with very, very impressive principles. Um, but nonetheless, that's going to become more of a necessity. And I think there's a very good paper in this collection by the um, principal of, the, of Glasgow's um, college. Uh, the reason Glasgow is cited is that Scotland has had a much bigger hammering um, in the FE sector than England partly because the nationalist government chose to channel money towards university tuition fees uh, rather than to FE, and they were hit first and harder. So the colleges have had to adapt, um, and they've had to become very entrepreneurial. And Glasgow is a good example of a college that's been through complete transformation in order to survive and uh, actually now perform an extremely good and creative role. So that kind of experience and teaching and helping um, people in leadership positions uh, would seem to be a very useful additional step. So that's effectively what I have to say. Uh, I, I'm very conscious that um, people in the FE sector have been through a difficult time, a combination of funding squeezes, um, an inspectorate that doesn't appear to understand or value what it does, uh, and you know, now the area reviews. But I think as a result of the thinking that's going on, uh, and particularly this very valuable collection of essays, I think there is a good reason for optimism. I've tried to sketch out what some of those reasons are, but hopefully from discussion we can advance it further. Thank you. Um, can I just ask you a political question rather than a question about, uh, are, are you being too sanguine about the devolution agenda surviving the change of Prime Minister? That is to say that the concern I have is firstly that, that the devolution agenda isn't that popular amongst Conservative grassroots uh, who are certainly opposed to certain elements of it, like for example uh, mayors, and secondly George Osborne presumably will have a different role, if any role at all. So I just in, I'm just interested in your sense that we, I think you said we passed the point of no return on that. Well, that's just a, a judgment I'm making. I mean, you're right that, that Osborne did 
lead it, but, but actually it was a cross-government initiative. Um, uh, and, and these days, of course, most uh, city councils, uh, certainly not shires, tend to be labour-led. And rather cynically, actually, it was a way that government could keep them occupied, <laughs> you know, give them more powers, let them run their own show, and then they won't appear in Westminster. There's a little bit of that. But um, I, 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 th I think particularly once you start getting powerful personalities taking over at a local level, you, you, the momentum goes in a different direction. I read today, for example, that in Birmingham, Sir Digby Jones, I think Lord Jones, isn't it, is planning to run for mayor. I have feelings about the gentleman that I won't express, but nonetheless, he is a, he is a major figure and a very substantial influence. And once people like that start wanting to take leadership positions, um, they, they will demand more attention for their areas. It, it may well be in a very uneven way. I mean, you may get, I mean, there are areas like the Solent, for example, where the cities are at loggerheads with the conservative-led showers within the counties and nothing's happening. But elsewhere, where you have more coherent groups, um, Manchester led the way, obviously, but Birmingham, Leeds, Liverpool, um, Newcastle in due course, um, you have c coherent entities which will have significant power, and that will include you know, skill training and FE, almost certainly. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, so we have uh, four respondents. They, they could each speak for 20 minutes, but they've been given five. Uh, Vince, has got to go to a, uh, Vince has got to go to a, a rally at, at 10 past seven, and one of our speakers has got to go to his leaving do at 10 past seven, so we can't go on. I hope it's not mine. Uh, no, I, I'm not going to tell you who, which of the four of you it is, actually. I've been told privately. No, um, I, I, think, uh, uh, I think the person in, in concern knows who it is. Okay, so, um, Martin. Martin Dull, Chief Executive of the Association of Colleges and the first federal chair of FE and Skills at the Institute of Education. Martin. And I volunteered to go. So, that, that, um, <laughs> it is indeed you. Uh, interestingly, just very quickly, Lord Digby Jones is also the uh, chair of uh, Stratford upon Thames College, Stratford, sorry, Stratford upon Avon College in Birmingham, right. um, which kind of indicates, view or otherwise of him, the interest being taken in skills generally. I, in terms of this, it's a reason to be, be cheerful moment, and it's quite hard to see sometimes reasons to be cheerful where we find ourselves presently, but I think there are some, and the, docu the, 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 the collection makes a contribution in that regard just by asking that beguilingly simple question, what if, which actually takes you out of where you are now to imagine and see a different future and consider the mess you're in now compared to what could be in the future. And I think it makes that, I think, is an enormously helpful way just looking at the world. So that makes a contribution. But adopting that expansive mindset is quite difficult currently within the sector. Um, particularly, I have to say, in this regard, and I'll come back to the wider sector within colleges, as you're about to, to, to head into error reviews, you're undergoing those error reviews, which find feels like a very challenging, difficult process, which actually threatens people's careers, uh, threatens a good deal of in, imposed change or, or directed change or encouraged change. But actually, you know, you excavate under that and you find a reason to be optimistic, and, and it's this. Compared to the, the, when Vince made some remarks, we discussed it one stage about people being out to get FE, there's an implied acceptance through error reviews that we need a pattern of colleges in order to deliver on government's intentions. And therefore, they constitute an essential part of the landscape. Now, the numbers of colleges, their disposition, their particular roles might be at issue within the error review process. But the fact that we're having an error review to manage into a pattern of colleges which is sustainable carries within itself an acceptance that colleges are an absolutely necessary part of our landscape. I mean, that's a part of a slightly cup half full reason for optimism. If I came to another slightly other related cup half full, is actually these, this sector, both colleges and independent trade trying to provide, are the ultimate survivors. Uh, and I don't quite buy into whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger, but there's a certain amount of entrepreneurial characteristics that Vince identifies, which arise from having to make your way in the world without any strong champions quite often. So there is an inherited set of behaviours which will allow this sector to survive whatever. 
My concern, I think, in that is it sometimes survives in order to survive, which begins to talk about the, the issue Vince raised about having a clear role, and, and dual mandate is one way of looking at it. I mean, I had poor time to talk about football, but you know, the football analogy is this. You, sometimes the sector thinks too much about the externalities and not about how its own team plays, what its own team does, and how strong that team is, and what it's good at, and actually has its own game plan. It begins to be blown about by policy rather than have a firm sense of self and direction. And I think that's where, in the circumstance we're heading into, I find the greatest sense of potential uh, for innovation and actually self-direction. Uh, and against that background, there actually, I think, will be a greater degree of policy stability for some of the reasons that Vince was identifying. The distraction factor actually could potentially be a really strong ally to our sector around the fact that there's a good deal of consensus around the need for apprenticeships, the need for a, a re revived and revised higher technical professional education system for all young people to have strong literacy and numeracy skills and actually for there to be an end to intergenerational uh, unemployment. Those are really strong imperatives which will survive whatever is going on. And we have a course of action in pretty much all of those which is established. The detail needs to be worked through, but the direction of travel is pretty much shared. Now, in that circumstance, I think there's, there's room for colleges and the rest of the sector to begin to work out a firmer sense of who they are, what they do, and why and what they are not the core of the role. The very example that Vince talked about, a college electing to be, concentrating on a particular set of students and a particular need in a particular place, rather than just throwing their arms out to, to collect any funding source. So a firmer sense of themselves and the distinct contribution that they therefore will make. And that, if that's colleges, then you begin to talk about the rest. The, the whole issue of error reviews, and actually interestingly I think the levy, begins to imply this is not a marketised system in the way we have become used to it developing. This is a managed market. This is kind of a bit more of an ecosystem where people have roles within it. And I think if between ourselves, private training providers, or colleges and private training providers and other partners here, we have more distinct roles within that ecosystem, more clarity about what we're for, then we'll be begin to emerge into a, a sense of a, a more unified sector of a sense of direction out of this melee that we're currently in. So I do find up reasons to op for optimism, but I do really think we need to think much more about in these circumstances who we're for, what we do, and why, and what distinctively we can contribute as a sector without trying to do everything. Great. Thanks, Martin, uh, for that. Now, uh, Sue Husband, Director of the Apprenticeships and Delivery Service at the Skills Funding Agency at BIS, charged with the small uh, task of delivering three million apprenticeships. How's it going, sir? It's going well. We're, we're on track. Good. Oh. Over to you. Okay. So um, in the five minutes that I have, um, it won't surprise you to hear that I want to uh, briefly mention apprenticeships, uh, devolution and leadership. Um, and despite the monumental changes that we've seen to the political landscape in the last two weeks, there is one priority that has not moved an inch. The vision of three million good quality apprenticeship starts by 2020 remains steadfast. And that's apprenticeships available across all sectors of the economy and at all levels. And optimism is inherent with apprenticeships. For businesses, embracing apprenticeships makes great commercial sense, harnessing talent to ignite a vibrant workforce and to drive a strong competitive advantage. And for individuals, that's three million life-changing opportunities and three million opportunities to secure entry and to progress diligently, um, potentially in a, a dream career. And that opens up a wealth of opportunities to so many individuals. And that's all the way from level two apprenticeships through to higher and degree apprenticeships. And it will please Vince to hear that we're actually making good progress now with UCAS. Um, so we do hope in the next couple of years that actually people who are considering a degree apprenticeship can actually see all of those opportunities um, through the UCAS portal. And I think that will be a game changer. Um, apprenticeships give young people in particular, but not exclusively, the energy as well as the platforms to show their skills and expertise. And I think that's hugely exciting for the sector. 
And the other part of the apprenticeship jigsaw is, of course, the role of training providers. And in the future, we will have to have a more agile and higher quality um, market. So colleges and independent training providers meeting the involving needs of employers up and down the country. Because the reforms and the growth aims for apprenticeships offer significant revenue generating streams for training providers, positioning apprenticeships as the largest part of the vocational market. So training providers can be both optimistic and indeed proactive in rising to the challenge of reforming apprenticeships and funding. The apprenticeship levy will mean greater number of employers connecting with apprenticeships. And we need training providers and colleges to be ready to respond to this demand and use the months ahead to prepare to develop and deliver the off-the-job training needed for the new employer-designed standards. And the new standards are an improvement on frameworks. They're designed by trailblazers. They set out clearly the knowledge, skills and behaviours that employers need. There are now 140 trailblazers involving 1,300 employers, over 200 new standards published. Over 60 of these are in higher and degree apprenticeships, and a further 150 are in development. On degree apprenticeships, we have 20 universities working with FE on qualifications up to level seven. And the last first statis first, sorry, statistical first release showed that the trajectory of apprenticeship starts is going in the right direction. And remember, quality is an inherent part of apprenticeships, and quality has been the driving force behind the reform over the last few years. And so the future is full of promise with apprenticeships, because the Skills Funding Letter 2016-17 shows a billion pounds to support apprenticeships for adults. With the levy, adult apprenticeship funding will be 1.48 um, billion by 2019-2020. And that massive investment gives the entire sector optimism, confidence and ambition for the future. And talking of investment, I should touch on devolution. Ten devolution deals and agreements have already been reached. They cover Cornwall, Greater Manchester, Liverpool, the North East, Sheffield and the West Midlands. And nearly all of these deals involve elements of skills funding and apprenticeships. Devolution deals will provide specific localities with the powers they need to make their own funding decisions based on their individual priorities. Devolution is a great opportunity for training providers to give employers exactly what they want on a local basis with defined outcome agreements. And devolution can trigger greater innovation in training and skills using the power of local networks, local knowledge and local leadership to drive change and to improve local growth. And that's another reason to discount any fears or uncertainty about the future. And I think the future lies in leadership. Last week, I actually read with interest the report put together by the AELP, the 157 Group and the Further Education Trust for Leadership. And I applaud its call for new talent to lead FE and skills providers. We always need new and fresh thinking to challenge existing strategies and to reinvigorate the plans for the future of FE and skills. The FE sector doesn't have a monopoly on knowledge and I've spent most of my life in the private sector and I've seen skills in FE from a different mindset and perspective and what we need from everyone in the sector is clear determination, endeavour and sheer commitment to make FE the best it can possibly be. And if some of that group of people is from a new sector altogether, that should be welcomed. The individuals with that vision will bring the innovation, imagination and optimism. Because what matters most is making the impact of FE and the outcome for skills delivering a massive difference to employers, learners and communities across the country. Where people talk about the role of FE as a catalyst to make businesses more productive, to make communities more inclusive and to give talented individuals every opportunity to impress and succeed in whatever they want. Thank you. Thank you. So I always feel like I could shout hallelujah at the end of that. It was so, <laughs> so uplifting. Thank you for that, Sue. Right, Adam, follow that. Adam Marshall, Acting Director General of the British Chambers of Commerce, where he's charged with representing the interests of many thousands of companies and working at the highest levels of business, government and the media to tackle many of the key issues facing firms in Britain today. Adam, are you going to continue this optimistic Tied. I am. Good. Matthew, I am. Good. Uh, because I think we have to be optimistic uh, in order to uh, address the period of transition that we have as a, as a country ahead. And this agenda is obviously a key part of that. Um, 
When I was reading through the uh, document that we've been presented with this evening, I paused on a sentence uh, in Mark Lonsborough's introduction, uh, which said uh, this is a chance to redefine the sector as a dynamic, entrepreneurial, innovative force for city and regional development, learner engagement, and civic pride. And that stuck with me throughout everything else that I read from this excellent collection. And the reason for that is I've spent 15 years in the local economic development agenda, and never before have I had such a, a, a succinct statement of what this sector could be in terms of its contribution, and never before have I had the sense that when it comes to devolution, this time things are different and that it's much more real. I feel like this is the third time I've been around the devolution cycle. The previous two times, I, I got to the end of the circle and realized nothing had actually changed. This time, power and money are actually moving, and I think that there is a real opportunity uh, for this sector going forward. Um, my day job is to represent 52 chambers of commerce, so that they in turn have 75,000 business members with 5 million employees. Um, so I'm looking after the fundamentally local interests of business, including the development of their existing and their future workforce. Um, in doing that role over the last seven years, I've, I've, I've argued a lot for a more comprehensive partnership between local businesses and FE colleges to close skills gaps, to crowd in business investment, and also to boost local productivity. Uh, that, that's been something that has sometimes been hard to do up against what I call the, the, the BBC bias uh, of the media. I, I think the media is partially responsible for the fact that we have so much obsession and focus on HE and HE entry in this country rather than on FE. Um, and having to spend time as a representative of business arguing for the 65% of young people who will never see the front gate of a university but who have so much to contribute to local businesses is in fact an incredibly motivating thing to do and one where I think this opportunity that I was referring to a moment ago is now really coming into the frame. Uh, in doing that though I felt stymied uh, at times. Uh, patchy responsiveness within the sector to business needs and interests um, in a lot of cases, engagement is still simply not good enough. For every amazing college that does hugely strong work with local businesses and does what Martin says and focuses in, drills in and really addresses local labor market needs, there are others who don't. Uh, and we see all sides of the sector. And of course, I have to point a finger at my own constituency in business and say that there are plenty of businesses that moan repeatedly and don't do enough to engage themselves. So it actually goes both ways. This is a two-way deal. Um, I've also felt stymied, of course, by the constant change in government policy uh, facing this sector, often accompanied by the wrong metrics, the wrong financial incentives, etc., that leads to some of the strange outcomes uh, which we have seen, and this national obsession with qualifications which businesses see as outputs rather than future prospects and destinations which businesses see as outcomes. Um, and, and moving past all of that towards this more, more holistic, more local discussion of how businesses and training providers, especially colleges, get together to shape the future for local young people, for people in work who are looking to upskill, etc., is something that we can all be passionate about and all get behind. Um, so I think it's really excellent here to see a call to look into the future and look at long-term optimism rather than the sort of short-term pessimism and firefighting that often characterizes debates around this particular sector. Um, from the business perspective, a couple of immediate things we'd want to see. One is an end to constant change in the sector. I know we've got yet another skills white paper coming our way. Uh, I think this has to be the last for a generation if we're really going to deliver improved outcomes. The reason I say that is because businesses operate on what I call a one, five, ten year rule. It takes them a year to hear about something, five years to think about engaging with it, and ten years to really start to feel comfortable with it. In this country, we operate policy on the basis of a one-month, five-month, ten-month rule, uh, and it all changes and we all start all over again. We have to get it to stick if we're going to get it to work. Um, that also comes along with funding stability and also something else which is hugely important, which is not talking about this in isolation, but considering training alongside migration policy, alongside housing policy, and alongside benefit policy. All four of those things interact so, so much in terms of the prospects for young people and indeed the productivity uh, prospects for our businesses. We need to look at them in the round. Uh, for the sector, I guess my plea is continued engagement, engagement, engagement with local firms a relentless uh, attempt to understand and cater to local labor market need. And even though working with small companies can be both the most rewarding thing and the most frustrating thing that you ever do, please stick at it. We know it's difficult, but, but it's so important and so 
special to see when that partnership develops and when a business then rockets off the back of it. Um, so I think I want to echo Martin in terms of my final point, which is this, really. The sector needs a vision and a bit of a USP, just like businesses need a vision and a USP. And I came up with three phrases that really encapsulate it from our perspective in the business side. The first is we want FE colleges to be the destination of choice for young people who want to get ahead uh, in local business and in their careers. The second is we want it to be the destination of choice for people at work who want to grow their career potential. And then the third, coming back to Vince's theme of demographics, is we want it to be the destination of choice for those who want to retrain for new careers and new opportunities. If we look at it like that, you will bring businesses with you as the sector grows, develops, and changes. And I think that that's something that we can all look forward to together. Thank you, Adam. Um, so, uh, Ruth, I'm Ruth Silver, founding president of FETL, highly influential, experienced educationist, former principal of Lewisham College. Ruth, I've always... I was thinking of Gramsci's injunction that we should demonstrate optimism of the will whilst uh, also experiencing pessimism of the intellect. I, I'm sure you feel optimism of the will. You always, all the years I've known you, you've always shown optimism of the will. What about optimism of the intellect? Uh, well, I, mean, I, th I think that's, that's really the whole point of why FETO was set up. I mean, I hope you'll excuse me if I completely ignore what it was I was going to say to you and let me say things that I want to say to you having heard, not just having heard what's been said here, but also having joined the RSE, which has been a terrific experience of Fettel in working with you, uh, and, and some of the essayists in joining you going around the country. So we were, I was there in Glasgow and in Manchester and indeed in London. And I, actually my optimism lies in the trust and faith that the people who came to hear us talk um, uh, showed us and it was really amazing because uh, I have been very closely encountering through our projects and fellowships this year some of the difficulties that the sector face and some of the gloom I think that's around uh, in people who are actually doing the job and listening to people telling them what job it is they should do um, and, uh, uh, and, and, le and let me say this that actually um, people are very proud and very um, strongly supportive of what it is further education does. And that's because we share a meta task with them, and that meta task, of course, is public service. So others speak better of us than we speak of ourselves. And um, having heard the reasons to be uh, uh, cheerful, let me just make some reasons to be careful if that's <laughs> what you're talking about. And there is something to be careful in that, actually. It, the sector has been beleaguered, as you've described it, and belittled in some places as well. But actually, uh, there's one thing that just turns the, the volume up. Uh, and it's really what I want to talk about now, if, if you'll allow that. So just to say before I do, I completely endorse all that's been said about reasons to be cheerful. I can, Vince Cable must have been looking over my shoulder when I was writing my bit, because I absolutely spot the same opportunity that you do. But my reasons for, to be careful are something that's grown uh, uh, for, for a wee while now. And, uh, and let me say this. I am concerned about the state of the inner worlds of some of the leadership in our sector. And I'm not talking just about colleges, I'm talking about um, uh, uh, you know, the, AL, the ALP colleagues and charities who are also working on the same agenda as, uh, as us. And I see a, a schizophrenia. So the college, uh, the college sector, the public sector uh, are as we've described them. And in spite of all that, they will walk from here to Clachna Cudden, as we say, uh, to be of, 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 uh, of service to learners. And let me speak to the essays, and I loved all of them, but let me speak to the essays of Kuvi, who says to us, Kuri rather, um, actually switch the glossy marketing for real community connection and commitment. You know, talk to people about wh from where they're at, to build Lucas's stuff, and I've said this a long time, side by side with Bill, don't go for parity of esteem, it's different. Can we just value the difference and honour what that brings to people's lives? But I wanted to say the thing that turns the fuel up. And, and um, let me just say that Fertile itself was a piece of dignified, um, uh, I, I call it dissidence when I'm in a good mood and defiance when I'm in a bad mood. <laughs> because we had the chance to do something different when we closed down Elsis, the last 
improvement body standing because we had we had endowments from other places and we had earned some money ourselves and in the very hard work that closing something down is we learned that we had some options about what we did with that money and I was sent off by the board as the chair of the board to come up with an idea and FETO was it and it came from a memory in my own mind of being uh, reading a, an inspection report about a college I know well and loved enormously where the inspectorate talked about it was a college it was a thinking college this is before the private sector was involved. And I thought, wouldn't that be good to actually not think on, for the sector on behalf of the sector, but to give it the chance to think for itself and to speak for itself. And actually, uh, what does that need? That just needs space, space and money to pay for that. So managed to persuade the board that uh, the, the innovation that is fatal uh, actually uh, w was much needed and everybody loved it and, and I'm really grateful to all the sector bodies uh, who supported it fully. But I had a very difficult time in Whitehall, that's before you were there. I might have changed my mind if you'd been there, but anyway. Um, so I, I want to say a couple of things. Um, what has been lost in this melange of change has been actually the leadership that matters in this sector is the leadership for learning. You know, we've been we're acrobatic in our handling of budget change. We are uh, able to translate Ofsted in marketing speak to many places. Uh, and the notion of learning cities, for example, I think gives more power to the essays in the book uh, about, uh, about the sector itself and pedagogy and so on. Um, I know City of Glasgow College well. And uh, I mean, just to add to Vince's comments, what's different in Scotland is people are proud of doing high-level vocational professional qualifications in a way that they aren't in England, and I don't quite understand how that happened. And if you stand in, 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 uh, in, in Glasgow Central Station, you hear the lads and lassies talking about, actually, I'm going to go to here because with that I get um, work experience in Germany or something. Real sense of those qualifications are marketable in the world. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, from FETL, uh, which is, uh, and let me just say, the TUC said what, that FETL is the only innovation we've had for years and years. Uh, and, I, you know, and I think that's true because we don't do anything else Ourselves. We commissioned good folks like the RSA and other people to be curious on our behalf and to provoke us so that we too can, uh, can uh, feed the, 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 the rather empty minds uh, that, that we sometimes encounter. So going around uh, the country with RSA, my compliments to you, Matthew, on your staff and their, great, and their sense of authority, actually, even in working with bossy people like us, um, that actually they had a real sense of where FETL could help bring something uh, additional to the work of, of the RAC, and we're grateful that we had that experience. But I want to say a wee bit about what the, uh, the leadership of, uh, of um, learning would look like, if I can find the page that I've got to, actually, having turned over all that everything else said. So the SEs talk about leadership and leadership for learning because they talk about this new way of connecting. You've seen that. I've talked about some of those already. And new ways of being and new ways of valuing and also new ways of inspiring. We've heard it all before. Um, I want to say a word about the meaning of, uh, of innovation. I get very irritated by this. Because people talk about innovation as if it's invention. Let's invent something new. And I'm enormously freed up by the notion and definition of inno innovation as being a season's new growth. Uh, it, it is not about coming up with something completely new. It's moving it organically into its primary task in its new state. And I've lived through many generations of further education, and the joy has been how the DNA bits of the different phases uh, are needed now, really quite clearly. And I think this book starts to, uh, starts to call out for them. But I uh, want to say, uh, uh, let, me, uh, let me just find it. So I want to make my, the last comments about my own sense of the state of the leadership in the sector, uh, as I say, gathered in contact uh, with people we've had. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist originally, so I have the habit of wondering what behaviour means and what attitudes are telling us. And I notice the following. In the best of us in the sector, and the, the schizophrenia is about colleges are a bit beleaguered, and independent providers have got more money than ever had before, and they're really happy, and they're doing a fabulous job. And the weave between the seams is a difficult and dangerous weave unless we start to work together. I have a recommendation, Matthew, on that at the end. Um, but actually, let me see. I see in the best of us people working hard. 
people working hard to satisfy competing claims, budget cutting to fit purpose to purses, explaining to staff as best we can why the changes are happening, putting learners first and doing the best we know how. And the least of us are living with the exhaustions and partnerships they're passed, they're enforced, and peak all career around mergers, claims of innovatory new models which turn out to be the Darwinian reshuffling of market share and just trying to get by. So the move for me feels like it's something about move from partnership to fellowship. Take what learning we are leading into its place on the round table with schools and universities. Not so that, we, so not so that we're being protective about what it is that we do and, um, uh, and where we get to. So uh, recommendations, I'm alarmed at the absence of mention in govern about governance everywhere we go and actually how business governors come in and scare the hell out of principles by saying, oh, you can't do that. Um, in Wales is different I, uh, because Wales, the whole country of governors have a way of working together. But also the membership bodies, you are the authorised voice for us, and this is all membership bodies. And wouldn't it be great in order to take, to take charge of the opportunities that have been listed, if there was suddenly set up now a strategic um, body thinking ahead of all the membership bodies working from the different tribes in the sector. That would be innovation, and that would be innovation that actually could move learning forward. We must not miss this chance. Great. Can I ask you to give our whole panel a round of applause for their contributions? So, um, uh, uh, Martin, because of your meal and Vince, because of your rally, I can reassure you that clock is three minutes fast, but um, uh, that still means what we're going to do is this. I'm going to take no more than five or six contributions from the floor. They've got to be no more than one minute long. I can then bring the panel back and they've got no more than one minute to comment on one or two of the comments I've heard. I'm sorry it's all been squeezed, but that's because we've just got so many great speakers. I'll wait for the microphone to come to you when you uh, speak and we'll start at the back there. Hello, Ian Dodds. One of the things that we've not talked about um, is uh, the new factors of the generation coming into further education. Um, there's research now which shows that they see diversity very differently to any previous uh, generation. In other words, they see it being about diversity of thought. Uh, they've been interacting from the very earliest age on, uh, uh, digitally with people who are different from themselves. And they appreciate people who are different from themselves. And so I think that gives us some real opportunities in terms of creativity, opportunity, innovation, and working together. Great, thank you very much. Uh, yep, here we are. We've got, of course, we've got the authors of many of the essays of the, of the book here. So, it's good to hear from them. Bill Lucas, uh, one of the contributors. Thanks for the comments about learning, Ruth, really important. Uh, we've not mentioned schools at all. I'm worried that 16 to 19 is floating off into an imaginary future, and we're all very optimistic about that, but uh, I find many of the schools extremely gloomy about what the unintended consequences of some of the things that are going on. Thoughts? Tell us one of those unintended consequences. One of the... Unintended consequences. Um, because colleges, hypothetically, can offer options post-16, and in some rare cases post-14, they're less keen in collaborating with schools because they're competitors. Okay, pass it to Philippa. Um, thanks very much, wonderful panel, and one of the authors. Uh, I, I tell think... us who, I know who you are, but tell everyone else. Oh, I'm Philippa accordingly from the Centre for the Use of Research and Evidence in Education. I've got a different kind of question, which is, in a time of change, it isn't just what we can do, it's who we are. And we haven't talked about the role of the colleges in helping us all understand who we are as citizens together. And, and it seems to me it's never been more important to talk about that. So I just right. welcome thoughts yep. on that. Very timely point. Um, oh, front row. It's a Twitter question, is it? Or yeah. is it just your question? It was, it was my question. Go. Uh, I wanted to ask the panel about the Tell role who you of are. Uh, Tom Harrison from the RSA. Um, about the role of learners and students in developing this new kind of optimism for the sector. Very good. Uh, then uh, there's a gentleman there. I'm going to take a couple more and then that's it. Um, Mark Dorr from AALP with a very croaky voice. <coughs> um, I, I represent the, uh, the optimistic and proactive providers um, and I had a lot of positive things to say about what's coming along with the levy and everything else but I have a challenge for FETL uh, and, and uh, what's been written because it still feels like this is about the college sector. 
it's reimagining the college sector, and, and really this should be t entitled that, because if it was reimagining the whole system, I think there are many, many more things that could be thought about and many different ways of doing it. So it's, it's a challenge, really, to, to, one, have the honesty, but two, then to embrace that wider, wider opportunity. Okay, any other points? Or, yes, and then finally, and then panel choose one or two of these at, m at most to respond to before we close. Yep. Um, Sue Rimmer from South Thames College. Um, I thought the contributions and the essays, having a flick, flick, quick flick through them, were, um, were really good and very exciting in many ways. And I think the, what's been mentioned a number of times about the what if is, is really important. I think that area reviews present both an opportunity and a huge challenge. I think there is a huge danger that area reviews will be for colleges, what Brexit is for the government, because it's hugely um, time consuming and it could sap the energy. The, uh, one of the um, optimistic things about area reviews it is engaging local dialogue. And the actual local dialogue, which has nothing to do with who's going to merge with who, is actually provide some opportunity for um, understandings with, with business and with local authorities and with FE together. But I think that um, in terms of looking forward to the what if and envisioning the future um, could be challenged by the area reviews, but also, as um, was, was said by Adam, weighed down by the, the shackles that are constant change. Presumably, if the area reviews follow the model of Brexit, the winning colleges will then stab each other in the back and resign. <laughs> but, um, uh, okay, so panel, um, we'll go the same order, because so, I want to end, give the final word to, 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 to Vince. So, uh, Martin, uh, let, just pick one or two. I know they're all great questions, but just pick one or well, two. I'll connect to an answer for the one, and I think it... Mark, if I'm, I'm implying that it was colleges only colleges, I think it's wrong to imply that. What I was trying to say is people, if you specify role and define role more clearly, as it would be in any kind of ecosystem, there's more of a basis for collaboration. So people know what each other is about, and there's a basis on which you understand that the person next to you is doing. And you find role specification, and you optimise around your ability to deliver within that system. And Bill, I kind of, in this regard, I think that comes to schools. I, Sainsbury report, I think, will be out later this week, and I anticipate there will be some, some almost knee-jerk reactions to it, because I think it will be beginning to talk about much greater role specification between colleges and schools, and actually an academic route and a technical route. And you know, we'll fall back into, I have no doubt, a secondary modern grammar knee-jerk reaction here but actually having some greater distinctiveness of role allows people more able to actually cooperate one with another because you understand what you're doing within the system. So in that regard, Mark, I think there is room for both of them. Just one of the, the local dialogue part, too, I think is a real kind of opportunity for us. And Adam touched on this. I really do not want to exchange one form of central control for another form of central control, but just make it more local, with local authorities seeking to take back and direct what goes on in colleges and independent train providers. We really must break out of this to an attitude of outcome, of shared outcome agreements between us as partnered organisations delivering to a local agenda rather than just fall into another set of remembered behaviours and exchanging one set for hegemony, hegemony I would almost say it, for another. Good. Thank you very much, Martin. Sue? Um, I will sort of go to Ian's sort of first point about this um, younger generation, about how much they value um, difference in the workplace. And I think you, it won't surprise you, I'll talk about apprentices. And there's lots of evidence showing that um, having an apprentice in the workplace will improve not just the product that you're producing, but also the level of service. Um, and I think they're really invigorating um, workplaces because they're going in there um, in many workplaces now that haven't traditionally employed young people um, because of the apprenticeship agenda are actually opening up their workforce now and seeing how much of an untapped um, source of talent that there is there and I think it is really making a positive impact on workplaces um, and it's great that more businesses are embracing that and the other one I'll sort of respond to is Tom's um, point about students sort of developing that optimism um, and absolutely I think the thing that will really help 
um, society to understand the value that apprenticeships bring will be the young people that are going into apprenticeships. And that's the thing that keeps me going and makes me optimistic, is meeting young people every day who have chosen to do an apprenticeship, you know, made a very conscious choice to do that, despite perhaps not being told about it at school, um, but that they've made a choice that they are really happy with and they can see that their peers who've maybe gone on to university, some of them thinking, was it the right decision? That these young people are telling us that an apprenticeship is brilliant for them, it's really worked out, and they're the people I think in the future we need to give a, a bigger voice to, um, because they'll be what will help us to get to our three million commitment over the next few years. Hallelujah. Adam. <laughs> uh, just respond to three of them very quickly. Bill, I uh, share your concern about schools because my worry is we end up focusing only on Govian academics and not on employability of, of young people. So what we are doing as a business community is trying to bridge the gap by working much more closely with schools locally. Uh, and trying to help teachers and head teachers, of course, understand what the prospects are in local business and how they can help get their students towards them. Um, to Tom's point on the role of learners and students, uh, if, you, if, if you talk to most of my businesses, what they would say to you is that, well, this has all been shaped around learners and students, which is why we never get the people that we need coming out of colleges and educational establishments in the first place. That's an extreme view. What I'd like to do is to see learners and businesses together in a room talking about what they want the college or the educational establishment to do for them collectively and then see how the, the, the institution itself responds. I think that would make for a much more productive future. Um, and then finally, to, 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 to Mark's plea not to focus on just the colleges but to focus on the whole of the system, I couldn't agree more. Representing chambers of commerce, uh, some of whom are training providers themselves who have either delivered or brokered 4,000 apprenticeships in the last year, uh, plus uh, workplace training that I can't even count because I don't have any metrics or mechanisms to do it, I wholeheartedly endorse the fact that we need to be talking about the system as a whole. Great. Thank you very much. Ruth. I think I want to say really to all of it, um, actually uh, work with a generous fellowship, and there's a great phrase if we're picking favourite phrases um, in, in the report, I can't remember who wrote it, and, and for leadership to do so with deliberate idealism. Let's match the, let's match the optimism with that kind of deliberate idealism. Very good. Vince. Just a few key points. I totally agree with Adam about six forms in schools. We're heading to a world of small, uh, suboptimal six forms, almost entirely focused on academic uh, traditions going backwards. And I'm afraid that isn't Mr. Gove's legacy, um, and it, it's not helpful. I think on apprenticeships, having got this bandwagon moving six years ago, I'm delighted that there's still that optimism and drive. The one thing, one big reservation is this three million target. I know I am, have been a politician. I know why targets are important, but it does detract from the key issues of quality and level, which are actually much more important. Uh, on area reviews, I know because I'm in the middle of it with my own college, this is potentially a, uh, problematic and there is a drive to merger. Um, you know, merged colleges can be successful. I was impressed with what I saw at Birmingham and various other places, 50,000 students, but uh, I think mergers for their own sake, as I think one of the panel mentioned already, drain energy into administrative reorganization and away from learning. And the one worry I have about the area reviews is that uh, adult education falling through mm -hmm. the cracks. Um, adult education is terribly important. And my final comment was responding to the question about the role of learners. Um, I, one thing that was actually quite nice, I, I've just been invited by the National Union of Students to work with them on learner response to further education, maybe a good example of political wounds healing, um, that I can work with the National Union of Students, but, but they've invited me. Uh, and the, their point is that there are more students in FE than the, the members of the National Union of Students in FE than there are in universities. And that is their constituency. And they have very large numbers of apprentices and they want their voice to be heard. And I think that's a very important contribution that we haven't actually had tonight. Great, thank you, Vince. Well, um, please join us because uh, due to the beneficence of uh, Fettel, there is a free glass of wine waiting for you outside. So if you've agreed with the general optimism, you can say cheers. If you don't agree with it, you can drown your sorrows. Um, <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Sorry there wasn't much time for questions, but thank you for the quality of the questions you did ask. It just remains for me to ask you to join me in thanking Martin, Sue, Adam, Ruth and Vince. Thank you. Thank you.